Well, let me begin by reading a passage of Scripture, a very familiar passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 1. Again, a little bit of forewarning up, upstairs. I, if I can just extend the reading to verse 14, I'd like to read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And we're not going to comb through and look at everything that's in here, but we do want to see certain points that are in here. And I also want to go back to Romans chapter 9 and, and draw some points out of there as well, as well as other parts of Scripture. But let's begin by reading the text. Um, Paul, writing to the Ephesians, is talking about <clears throat> the blessings that are ours because of, of really the work of, of the triune God in choosing to glorify his name in bestowing uh, his grace and salvation. Um, and that upon some and not all. I think we're, we, we all believe that. We all certainly understand that because not everybody is saved, right? God is absolutely sovereign. But let, listen, try to follow what Paul is saying here. This is actually, I think, verses 3 through 14. In the Greek language, in the Greek text, is one sentence. So, um, you know, they, they didn't think about shortening things up to make it simple in those days. They just, you know, simply, simply wrote. So let's try to follow his uh, line of, of thought here, and, um, and we'll see where we go. Okay, so first of all, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. I can't, I can't help but stop here and just point this out. He didn't choose us because we were holy. He didn't choose us because we would choose Jesus Christ and become holy. He chose us that we might be holy, okay? He chose us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us faith so that we would be holy. So yeah, this is another point we will look at a little bit more as well, okay? That we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Why? Uh, according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Now, we're going to go through here and pick up certain themes that are woven uh, through here, but I hope you can see a couple of things that um, uh, God chose us. If we're trusting in Jesus Christ this morning, if we're believing in Him, if we love Him, if we're worshiping Him, we're serving Him, that's because God chose us. He chose us in Christ. He chose us from all eternity. He chose us in order that He might forgive us, in order that He might give us this grace. And, and the other thing I don't want us to miss, which is why I wanted to add these concluding verses, was that, is this point, in Him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. The gospel is essential to this plan. And if the gospel is lost, then, then what happens, right? It's so important that we know what it is and that it be communicated. And that is the importance of the Reformation. So anyway, let's, let's get into that now as we think about this passage for a few minutes. And I'll just begin again by pointing out that uh, the reason why we're doing this is because it is that time of the year, 
when we celebrate the Reformation. And, and why is it this time of the year? Well, it's because it's this time of the year that the Lord kicked it off. Now, let me just begin by saying this, that when we celebrate the Reformation, we're not celebrating a man. We're not thanking uh, a man uh, you know, for what he did. We're not thanking Martin Luther, but rather we are thanking God for what he did through Martin Luther. Because it's almost, you know, 502 years ago, uh, it will be in just a couple of days, on October the 31st, 1517, that this young professor of theology from the University of, of Wittenberg in Germany nailed his 95 theses to the church door, calling for a public debate on the abuse of indulgences. And again, remember, indulgences were nothing more than pieces of paper that were authorized by the Pope, sold by Tetzel the monk, that claimed to guarantee that any satisfaction that we fail to make in this life before we die and leave this world for the sins that we've committed, that they would all be taken care of for the price of a few coins. In other words, he, some would say he was selling salvation, but, but technically that isn't correct. Uh, salvation comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, and even Rome believes that, but they believe that if we don't repair the damage that we do by the things that we have done with our lives while we're alive, if we don't make satisfaction, if we don't do enough penance, then we have to go somewhere, purgatory, and suffer for thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years before we can enter into heaven. Well, the Pope was basically selling a piece of paper that said, you don't have to suffer for millions of years. Your loved ones don't have to suffer for millions of years. You can just throw a few coins into the coffer and they'll immediately be released and you can be released. And it's possible that Tetzel may have gone too far and even promised forgiveness of sins. Well, the way the Reformation started was by Martin Luther challenging that particular doctrine. He basically said, if the Pope has the ability to sell indulgences, why doesn't he just give them away out of, out of Christian love? Well, that's one thing to consider, isn't it? Okay. Well, that's where it started, but of course it ended with the rediscovery of the gospel itself, and that is the most precious truth that God has ever given to us. So over the next three Lord's Days, we are going to remember the Reformation, and we're going to do it through this series of devotionals that um, I've, I've told you about through Ligonier that they prepared to celebrate the 500th anniversary of this event. Now tonight, Dr. Stephen Nichols is going to remind us about um, that, that the Reformation is a rediscovery of the gospel. By the way, he does an excellent job. They, each of these devotionals lasts about 18 minutes, so we're going to do two of them each of these three nights because, well, there are five and there's a Q&A session. But the way he brings it about or the way he explains it um, is, is very good. I would encourage you to, to be here for that. And then the pastor of the church where it's being held, Burke Parsons, is going to tell us why we should not be ashamed of the gospel. And I think you can see if it's the only way of salvation and the way God reveals his love and the way we are saved, the only way we are saved, how could we be ashamed of that? Next week, we're going to see Derek Thomas remind us uh, what the Lord did through Luther to rediscover and promote the gospel. Sinclair Ferguson is going to remind us of how the gospel is the only way we can have peace with God because we are at war with him as we come into this world. We are his enemies. He's our enemy, and yet he loves his enemies. We, we know that. Um, but the only way to have peace, the only way to put down the weapons of warfare is to come to him through Jesus, and that is the gospel. And then finally, Sproul is, Dr. Sproul is going to remind us again of the only way we can receive the blessings that Jesus Christ came to give, to give us, and that is through faith alone. That is the heart of the Reformation. That is the rediscovery of the gospel, that it is by grace alone. Oddly enough, Rome actually believes that, but by faith alone, that it may be by grace alone. Rome did not believe that. Rome believed there were a lot of works that had to be done, the works of the priest, your works, in order to get you into heaven. No, it is by the work of Jesus Christ alone, received by faith alone, that it may be by the works of Christ alone. That is the heart of the Reformation. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And again, to complement this, we're going to use the next three Lord's Days to look at why the gospel is so precious. I've already told you it's because it's the work of the triune God. You know, the only work that he has done to save. This is the only way of salvation, the gospel. You cannot be saved apart from it.
typically. There are exceptions in some regards. The, the idea that God can save, of course, people that are never actually reach the point where they can understand the gospel. There are people, you know, who are in that category. If we say you have to understand the gospel before you can be saved, we would have to eliminate all the, all the children who die in infancy. So we know that, that there are exceptions, but this is the rule. And we can't, we can't expect that somebody who is an adult and who can understand these things is somehow going to be saved apart from this gospel. So we need to understand this is the only work he has done. And it is very, that makes it very precious because without it, we will be lost forever. Now, this morning, what I'd like us to do is consider the first part of this, the work of the Father in saving us. What did the Father do? Well, the Bible tells us that in eternity, he chose us. He chose to save us, and he also chose to give the price that was necessary for our redemption, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the work that Jesus does is, of course, he comes and he pays the price, and we're going to look at that next week. And then following that, we need to see the work of the Holy Spirit who actually applies what Jesus did uh, to us. So again, it's the work of the triune God, and we, we need to, uh, to see that, to see its preciousness. So first of all, let, this morning, let's consider that the Father chose us. Now again, before we look at this point, we do need to be reminded of one very important thing, and I think this, this is probably one of the areas where we have the disagreement with those who believe that what God does, He does for all, and you know, disagree with us that what God does, He does for those whom He's chosen. And that important point is this, that the work of salvation that God has done, that he worked out through Jesus, was not primarily, first of all, mainly, it was not for our benefit, okay? It's not that, that God was, was so full of love and, you know, he couldn't stand to see anybody perish that he, that he had to do this, okay? That's, that's not the reason why he did it because, he, you know, man is at the center of everything and God basically becomes, as it were, our servant in order to take care of our needs in this way. That's not really what the Bible tells us. Now, it does tell us that God does love us. You know, He loves even the unregenerate with a love of goodness and benevolence. He is kind to the ungrateful and, and the evil, and his, his kindness and His patience is meant to lead people uh, to salvation. And He particularly, though, has a love for those who are the ones that He has loved from all eternity and chosen. But we do need to understand that we are not at the center of this work that God did of redemption. The Lord did what He did for His glory. He did what He did for the reason He does everything that He does, and that is for His glory. God is at the center of all these things. Paul reminds us of that when he comes to the grand conclusion of speaking about the work of God and working out our salvation in the book of Romans. He comes to Romans 11.36 and he says this, and we often read this and really don't understand it. He says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, what Paul is saying is that everything that there is comes from God. Everything that there is comes through God, and everything that exists and everything that is done in this world is to Him or done for His benefit, for His glory, which is why He says, to Him be the glory forever. The reason why God does all that He does is for His glory. He's at the center. We aren't at the center. Now, if we don't understand this, we're really not going to understand why it is that God does not save everyone. I think we would all admit God could have. He could have saved everyone. But I think we would also all admit that he hasn't saved everyone. There are people who die without Christ. There are people, the Bible tells us, who are actually suffering in hell. What that tells us is that God did not intend to save everyone because if he had, everyone would be saved. He didn't do all of this for his glory, or I should say he didn't do all of this to save all mankind, for mankind's benefit. But what he did, he did for his glory. That's the reason why God created the world. And what I mean by the world is, of course, the cosmos, the universe. He created it for his glory. You know, if God intended, of course, just to save mankind, you know, why did he create the universe and all the sun, moon, and stars and everything that's out there? Well, he, he did it because... He wanted to show us His glory. 
He wanted to show us the glory of his power and his wisdom. And I think when we look at the creation, particularly when you stand on a mountain, you know, in the middle of perhaps a, a winter night when it's clear and you can see all the stars, it feels like you're standing on the edge of the galaxy and you just marvel at, at the creation of God. You see his power and you see his wisdom. His glory is the reason why he created the planet on which we are living because this is the grand stage, as it were, in which he would work out his plan of salvation. It is the arena, okay? This is the environment in which it would take place. The reason why he sustains the world is that he might bring this work to its completion, that he might save all whom he intends to save, that he might give them to his son. So he sustains the world that he might glorify his grace and his mercy and that he might bestow glory on his son. But you see, this is also the reason why he has chosen to save any, is that he might reveal the glory of his grace, that he might show mercy, that he might show his forgiveness, uh, that he might show how loving he is. Grace is really an expression of love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But that's also the reason why he, he did choose not to save others. And that is that he might reveal another aspect of his glory, which is his justice. You know, um, we should pause for a moment, I think, and consider how thankful we should be that God decided to glorify his grace because you realize God in his justice could very easily, when Adam sinned and, and fell, he could have easily blotted out everything that he made and said, I'm done with it, okay? But that was not his plan. His plan was to allow that to take place, allow Adam to make that choice, plunge the human race into sin in order that he might show his mercy and grace by giving the ultimate price and bringing about the work of redemption. If God had not decided to reveal his grace, the glory of his grace, we could never have been saved. The salvation would not be possible, wouldn't exist. Now, Ed, Jonathan Edwards pointed out that God did everything he did to show his creatures, to show his angels and to show us, everything that he is, to reveal all of his glory so that we might worship him and that we might glorify him and give him the credit, ascribe to God all the glory of everything that he is. And that certainly applies, of course, to salvation. But he said that to remind us that there's nothing hidden in God, essentially, God has revealed the whole breadth of his being to us so that we might glorify him, even though it's also true at the same time because of our limitations. We will never see the depth of the glory of his attributes because he is an infinite God. Now, the point we want to look at more specifically is that for his glory, the Father has chosen to save us. We did not choose him, but he chose us. And as I've said, there's many Christians today who don't believe this. So we do need to ask the question, how do we know that's true? Well, we know it's true because of what we've already read in Scripture. I mean, God's the one who tells us it's true, so that settles the question. Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, he chose us in him. That is, the Father chose us in Christ. Uh, he chose those of us, we, we, we don't know exactly everyone whom he's chosen, but we do know that if we've trusted him, that he's chosen us. We do know for those who will trust him, that he's chosen them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he chose us not because we would trust him or that we did trust him, but he chose us so that we might trust him. Again, faith is a gift of God. Faith and trust is the evidence that God has first loved us and chosen us. Now, God is the one who makes the choice. We, we saw a very clear example of that in Romans chapter 9. Remember how God chose to love Jacob, but not Esau. He chose to hate Esau. In, in verses 11 through 13, we read this. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now, I, you've probably heard this before, but on one occasion, Spurgeon was preaching on this particular passage, and a woman came up and approached him, 
uh, following with an objection. She says, I have a problem with that passage. Spurgeon replied to her, I have a problem with it too. What's your problem? Well, the fact that God hated Esau. How could God hate Esau? Well, Spurgeon said, he goes, oh, I don't have a problem with that. He goes, Esau was a wicked man. Esau was self-centered. Esau was carnal. Esau thought only about himself. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge, and he despised God. I don't have any problem at all understanding how God could hate him. My problem is, how could God love Jacob? <laughs> that rogue who tried to supplant his brother throughout his entire life and even deceived his father into giving him the blessing, essentially stealing it from Esau. Now, you know, most evangelical Christians today have the same problem as this woman had. They don't question that God loved Jacob, you know, because God loves everyone. But what troubles them is that God hated Esau even before he was born. But the question is, should that really trouble us? Now, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, but let me give you another example. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 9 to tell us that God chose to raise Pharaoh up as a great power in the world and basically to enslave his people, to persecute them so that God might glorify his grace in delivering his people out of Pharaoh's hand, but also that he might reveal his justice throughout the world by destroying Pharaoh's kingdom. We read in verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up. Notice the personal individualism here. I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, basically to destroy you and your kingdom, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. You know, as I mentioned earlier, as we go back into the book of Exodus, we find that God even is said to have hardened Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would not let the people go, so that God would execute his judgments on Egypt and reveal his power to the world. We read in Exodus 4, verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, we do need to be careful how we understand that, okay? We should not understand this as God injecting evil into Pharaoh's heart or making Pharaoh an evil man. We need to understand this as God using the evil that is already in Pharaoh's heart to do his purpose. What he did was he exposed Pharaoh to Moses, and he knew that when Moses stood before him and said, God says, let my people go, that Pharaoh was going to harden his heart. But God is the one who sent Moses to it and God to, to Pharaoh and did not restrain Pharaoh's heart. So God ultimately is, is the one who is said to harden his heart, but God is not responsible for the evil that Pharaoh committed because it was Pharaoh's own evil. But again, we ask the question, how, how could God treat Pharaoh in this way? How could he harden Pharaoh's heart? Why, why didn't he soften his heart? Why didn't he, you know, just make him let the people go? Why did he harden it so that he would bring all these judgments by refusing to do what God commanded? Well, Paul goes on to answer these questions by saying essentially this, God has the right over the clay, over all humanity, to do what he wills. Romans 9 verse 21, does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. He goes on to say that he can make vessels, again, for destruction, and he, and he can make vessels for mercy. Now, the big question is, how can God do this? Well, I think the answer is, of course, in the nature of the clay, isn't it? Because this clay is not unfallen man. It's not pristine righteous, holy, innocent man that he's making these vessels out of, the clay that he is using for the vessels is fallen in Adam and already under the wrath of God. Let's not forget what Paul says in Romans 3 verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He can do this because everyone in the world, everyone who comes into this world already deserves 
everlasting destruction. How can God be just and take some of these and intend them for judgment? Well, he can do that because he's simply giving them what they deserve, isn't he? I mean, everyone by their sins deserves everlasting damnation. That's what the Bible says because we have sinned against an infinitely holy God. And so when God gives them over or leaves them in their sins to perish, he's just simply giving them what they deserve. And that's exactly what justice is. Now, the bigger question is, how can God choose to be gracious to prepare some of this clay for heaven and be just in order that he might glorify, the, you know, basically show the angels and the redeemed his, his glory? How can he do that? How can he be just and do that? Well, he can do that, of course, because of his mercy and his grace. Paul writes in Ephesians 3, verses 4 through 6, In love he predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. God can do this. And we'll see in just a couple of moments why. But again, I want to answer this objection. Some believe that God chose us in eternity, because he looked ahead down the corridors of time and saw that we would ultimately choose him. We do need to understand that if God did look down the corridors of time and look forward in time, which he doesn't have to do because God already knows everything is going to take place, we know what it is he would see, that no one would choose him because we're all evil and come into this world Hating him. I think, I think in order to, again to see the justice of God in, in the damnation of the wicked, in leaving some you know, to their sins, to perish in their sins, we need to understand the nature of the clay. John 3, verse 20, Jesus actually, in speaking to Nicodemus, tells us what the nature of that clay is. For everyone, he says, who does evil, and that would include everyone, there is none righteous, not even one, there is none who seeks for God. Jesus says, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. They don't love Jesus, they don't love the light, they don't love righteousness, they will not come to Jesus because they don't want their, their evil to be exposed. That's the reason why God can justly leave them in their sins, but it also is the reason why if there is a choice to be made, God is the one who has to make that choice. He has to choose us. He has to change our direction. And as we've already seen, Paul says, God did cho choose us. The question is, why did he choose us? Why did he choose anyone? Well, the Bible says that the distinction between us is not in us, the one that God makes between us, because when God looks at all of humanity, all he sees, apart from his grace, is sin and hatred and evil. There's really nothing that could distinguish us in his sight. So how does he make this distinction? Well, you know, the interesting thing is, the only answer to that question that is given is his good pleasure because it pleased God to do this. He chose us because for some reason, not in us, but in God alone, because he chose to love us, because it was pleasing to him to love us. Now, that really takes mankind and, and lowers it, you know, below any value at all, because we actually have a negative value. We, we are under the wrath of God, uh, and we see that his choice of us really had nothing to do with us. Paul writes this in Romans 8, 29, which is what Thomas Mayville was looking at last Lord's Day. For those whom he foreknew, and again, foreknowledge here is not what he knows ahead of time they're going to do. And it doesn't say, you know, for that which he foreknew we would do, but it basically says those whom he foreknew. The idea of knowledge or foreknowledge here is the idea of foreloving. Remember what uh, we read in Genesis 4 in, in the King James Version, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived, gave birth to a son. Well, how did his getting to know her and about her bring about this? Well, it's because knowing there is not referring to knowing about or knowing what somebody does, but it's referring to an intimacy or a love. Adam loved his wife Eve, and she conceived. 
And so when, when it says here, when Paul writes here, for those whom he foreknew, what it means is those whom he foreloved, he also predestined become conformed to the image of his Son. Before the foundation of the world, in eternity, Paul is telling us here, God loved us. And he chose us. He predestined us to become like his son. Not because he saw that we would choose his son and become holy in him, but that we might choose him and become holy in Christ. He chose us that he might give us faith, that we might trust in Jesus and be saved. Again, listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians 1.4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, we still need to come back to this other point. And the second point is essentially this, and it helps us understand how God can do this and actually be just. The Father not only chose us, the Father also determined, purposed in eternity to give the price or to pay the price for our redemption. Now, again, backing up, we can understand how God can be just in condemning the wicked. That's what justice is, giving someone what they deserve. God is not bound to show mercy to any. And so if he, he could give us all justice. And again, if he gave us all justice, what we would all get is, is hell. That, that's the condition we are in. We understand that. But how can God be just in forgiving the wicked and bringing them into heaven. How can he be just in showing grace to anyone? Well, the reason he can do that, of course, is because of Jesus Christ. Now, again, if we were to go back to our passage in Ephesians chapter 1, we, we could note a few things, and let me just note them very quickly. That everything that, that Paul says that has to do with God's choice of us is because of what Jesus would do, okay? It's because of him and him alone. Again, verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, okay? He chose us in eternity, not just absolutely, not apart from Jesus, but in Jesus. Verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. There is no adoption apart from Jesus. Jesus is the obedient son, and through his obedience, and being in Christ, we are adopted in the family of God. In verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. That's the only reason that's given, according to His good pleasure, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us, freely gave to us in, in the Beloved, in Jesus Christ. And the point is, is simply this, that God could never have overlooked sin. God cannot simply choose to forgive us for no reason. That would be unjust. It's not unjust of God to punish people for their sins. But it would be unjust of God simply to forgive us of our sins without there being any payment. But he can forgive us and be just if he makes a payment. And that's exactly what he in eternity purposed to do. That's why all these blessings are said to be in Christ. He would make a payment that would cover all of our sins so that he could forgive us and he could make us righteous and he could bring us to heaven and still be just. Now, that's exactly what Paul tells us in Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. And I'm going to read this passage and hopefully it'll make sense. I'm going to stop after each phrase and, and explain what each of these things mean because Romans can be a little bit difficult to understand. So beginning in verse 21 in Romans chapter 3, listen to what Paul writes here. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. In other words, you know, apart from obedience to the law, here is another way that we can be made righteous. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, which is God revealed it in the Old Testament that he was going to bring this about, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Okay, the righteousness which comes from faith. This is what the Reformation is all about. For there is no distinction, no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, which is what the earlier part of, of um, Romans is all about. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Because we've fallen short of the glory of God by our own works, we can't be saved by our works. Justification, forgiveness, being accepted by God is a free gift of His grace through Jesus Christ. Now notice this last part. Whom God displayed publicly... You know, he was crucified publicly, wasn't he? As a propitiation in his blood through faith. Okay, what he's doing, he puts Christ on display and he says, here is the payment, the payment for sin once and for all, for all who will believe in him, there is forgiveness. And this is the way that this can be just. He goes on to say this, to demonstrate his righteousness Because in the forbearance or the patience of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Why why was Jesus put to death? Why was he crucified? And why was he crucified publicly? It was so God could show that he was just in forgiving the sins of all he had forgiven beforehand and all who would trust in Jesus from that point forward. God is just because he made a payment, but he is also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Essentially, God will declare you to be righteous if you trust in Jesus. If you're trusting in Jesus, you are righteous in him. So to sum up, in eternity, before God created time, before he created the world, he loved us and he purposed to save us. And he could do this and still be just because he also eternally purposed to send his son into the world to pay for our sins. Now, if you're a believer this morning, what this means for you is this. If you're trusting Jesus to save you, if you're worshiping him and you're serving him, you know, showing that you really do love him, that you really are trusting him, then you can know that God didn't just start to love you at a certain point in time. You know, it's like he hated, you know, you're at war with him until the point at which you said, you know, I think I'm going to trust in the Lord, and you did, and then God started to love you. No, God loved you from all eternity. The fact that you love him means that he first loved you. And that love that he has for you is not something that started in time. When we talk about God making a choice here, we're not saying that God didn't love you and then he decided he was going to love you. Uh, We shouldn't think of God in those terms. His choices are essentially eternal purposes. This is how God has always felt towards you. He has always loved you, not because of who you were, but because of what you would be. You know, again, the idea that God doesn't love us because we were lovable outside of Jesus Christ. We were not lovable. He loved us because he chose to love us and send his son into the world to make us something he could actually love. Now, the other good news about this is this, because God has always loved you and because he loves you now, he will never stop loving you. You know, God, one thing about God is this, that he never changes. If he's loved you from eternity, he will always love you. That is, I think, perhaps one of the most encouraging uh, things that, that, that we can know and one of the things that our assurance needs to be based on. How do we know he loves us? It's because we love him and trust him. That's the evidence of his work in us. How do we know that he will not stop loving us sometime in the future? It's because he has always loved us and he never changes. Now, so far, we've just been talking about how this applies to those people who actually are trusting him. What about if you haven't trusted Jesus? How can you know whether or not he loves you from all eternity and has chosen you to be saved? Well, you know, none of us can go look anywhere. I mean, there, there is a reference to a book of life in heaven, whether that we should conceive of that as a literal book that we could actually go into heaven and open up the pages and read is questionable. It's probably just a symbol or you know, a, a representation of God's knowledge. He knows who, he, who, who belongs to him. We, we can't know the mind of God in this regard. We can only know by the effects. How can you know? Well, the only way you can know is by responding to the gospel, right? I mean, 
when the Philippian jailer came into the cell after the earthquake and the chains falling off and so forth, and he had, was going to kill himself, and they said, don't kill yourself, we're all still in here. When he comes into the cell, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, you know, I don't know. That's a good question because God is the one who actually makes this choice. So somehow you need to know that you're elect before you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And somehow I need to see you're somehow concerned about your salvation before I can offer the gospel to you. That's what some people say, okay? Now, what do they say to him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You see, we don't think about election when it comes really to evangelism. We do in a certain sense because we know God's going to save those who belong to him. But we don't just offer the gospel to the elect. We offer it to everyone, and everyone who believes is going to be saved. How do you settle the question of whether or not God loves you uh, from eternity in this particular way? You can only settle it by actually coming to Jesus Christ and trusting in him. If you don't, well, then it's not going to matter, right? Because you, you will suffer for all eternity. You need to come to Jesus Christ. That is the command of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, which means placing your whole hope of heaven exclusively on him. That's the only way any of us can know that he has loved us. But again, knowing that that is the case, um, again, is just a tremendous, tremendous blessing that we do not want to forget because we understand not everyone's going to be saved, right? God has allowed people to live and die through the centuries in absolute darkness without a gospel, without the truth. And those people were not saved, okay? They went into perdition. There are people living today who will live and die and never hear the gospel. The gospel does not get out to everyone. God is absolutely sovereign. And there are people who have heard the gospel. We live in a, in a society that's kind of saturated with it. And there are people who are going to live and die listening to the gospel their whole lives and never actually accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be thankful not only that God has brought the gospel to us, but that he has given us the grace to be able to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Now, again, let me remind you of this. The gospel is the only way that God reveals his redeeming love. The gospel needs to be gotten out to gather in those whom the Lord has chosen. That's the reason why the Reformation was so important because it was the rediscovery of that message the Lord uses to save. So I would encourage you, if, if the Lord in his providence gives you the opportunity to return this evening, as again we remember and thank the Lord for revealing that gospel again through somebody... Um, Martin Luther and, and others, you know, it's not just Martin Luther alone, but many others are involved in this Reformation. And we can be involved in it as well. You know, one of the questions that's going to be asked, you know, that Luther asked himself was this, what can I do? What can I do about this situation? I see the truth. What can I do about it? Well, we know what Luther could do because he did it. The Lord wants us to do what we can do about it as well to promote that gospel and, and to get it out. And I, and I hope the evening series will be an encouragement to that end. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply this, and then we'll move into the, uh, the Lord's Supper. <clears throat>